Hi everyone, um, thank you all for uh, dialing in tonight. Welcome to our second lecture in our national research webinar series in collaboration with ORUK uh, and BOTA. Um, it's a, a pleasure to welcome both Prof uh, Richie Gill and Mr. Mohamed Fahan Alani uh, to deliver this second lecture on how to write a research paper, talking about research questions and outcome measures. Um, so just some brief housekeeping before we uh, pass on over to Prof Gill. If we try and keep everyone's uh, mics muted just to um, avoid any disruption and please ask as many questions as you want through the chat box on Zoom and then we'll field all the questions at the end um, of, of, of the talks. Um, at, the, at the end of the talks, you can also, if you, if, you, if you prefer, feel free to put your hand up or unmute yourself if you don't want to type it. But try to leave it until the end of the talk to unmute yourself. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Prof Richie Gill, who is a professor of orthopaedic engineering at the University of Bath. He's also um, sits on the British Hip Society on their research committee. He's an editorial board member for the Bone and Joint Journal, and he used to be the president of the British Orthopaedic Research Society. So it's a really real honor to have him here and, and talk about um, uh, writing a research paper. It's also a pleasure to introduce Mr. Mohamed Fahan Alani, um, who's an SD4 trauma and orthopedic registrar on the Warwick rotation. He's also an NIHR doctoral research fellow at the University of Warwick. And it's a pleasure to have um, both Mohamed and Prof Gill with us today. So I'll hand over to Prof Gill. Okay, good evening. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me all right. Uh, maybe Shiv, you can put a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yep, okay, great. Uh, so I will share my screen and hopefully everything will work fine. So can you all see my slides? Maybe give me a thumbs up if you can see the slides. Okay, good. Thank you. It's just uh, don't tend to use Teams as much, uh, uh, sorry, Zoom as much as we do with Teams. So I've been asked to talk to you about how to write uh, a paper. I modified that a little bit and I put how to write a good paper, hopefully. So um, one thing, what a, a particular paper that has been very helpful to me over the years is this paper that's been published by Richard Brand, who was the editor of CORE, and Rick Huskers, who's the editor of the Journal of Biomechanics. Uh, I advise you to go and have a look at this because it's really helpful. It's a really well thought out um, and nicely laid out uh, short paper. It's very short and it tells you how to go about writing uh, a paper. It says for the Journal of Biomechanics, but I think the, the uh, information is suitable for all journals really. Just uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I published uh, over 250 papers. Um, I have a H index of 58 according to Scopus. And then you can see the citations by year. Uh, if you want to make yourself look better in the publication world, it's always uh, good to use Google Scholar. Citation index jumps up. Uh, H index, my H index is 68. Not quite sure what the algorithm is that they use, but uh, I've uh, published a fair few papers. So why, why would you want to write a paper? What is the purpose of a paper? And I think the primary aim is to really communicate so that you are uh, communicating with your peers. Who you're communicating to is really quite important. And you need to tailor the context of the paper to whom you are aiming to communicate with. Ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is to contribute to knowledge. That's another reason for publishing a paper. And in general, what we're trying to do in the research setting is disseminate research findings. Sometimes you are publishing a paper to show a consensus view and it may be that you're writing the paper in order to set a particular position on uh, an important topic. And it may be to raise awareness. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus mostly on disseminating research findings, being the underlying reason 
for writing this, this particular paper. That comes together with wanting to contribute to knowledge, and it all comes under the general heading of communication. So what is important is quality. Uh, those of you who are working in academic settings might be aware of the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, which is run by um, uh, the UK, uh, UKRI. And it's a way of assessing the quality of output. Um, it's not a perfect process, but what they have is they have a star rating. And ideally, what we want to be aiming for is the highest quality. And what they call four star is quality that is world leading in terms of originality, significance and rigor. And really, that's where you should be aiming to get to with every publication that you generate. Uh, there's three star quality that is internationally excellent in terms of originality, significance and rigor, but falls short of the highest standards of excellence. In the REF um, assessment exercise, all universities undertake this uh, every five or six years. Uh, you get no points for anything less than a three star. You get a small number of points for a three star and you get more points for a four star. And that's a major part of the assessment. So the quality of the research really matters. And one thing is very clear is that you can't turn three-star research into a four-star paper. You can easily turn four-star research into a three-star paper, but you really need that underlying quality of the research in order to be able to generate a high-quality paper. So quality is very important. And I would go as far as to say is high-quality research is what moves the field forward. Poor quality studies just consume resources and they just add to the general noise. Um, there's a lot of poor quality research that's published. And the volume seems to be increasing and it makes it more difficult to actually get to a point where you can get some benefit from the research that's been done. So the key words are originality, significance and rigor. It's somewhat difficult sometimes to understand the significance of something. And it may be that that significance doesn't come through until a, uh, a while after the paper has been published. But what we can do is we can focus on rigor. Um, originality uh, is an important thing that's judged. It's a bit difficult sometimes in the context of orthopedics to be completely original. Uh, but originality is something that is, you know, it, it's very difficult to come up with something truly original in a discipline where the pressing questions are really about treatment. Um, so originality is sometimes difficult. But rigor is the thing that we can do something about. And for hypothesis-driven studies, the choice of the primary outcome measure is critical. Actually, the, the way that the hypothesis is set is critical. And it must be set in a way that can be turned into a formulation of a null hypothesis and with a very clear way of answering with the primary outcome measure that's chosen. Okay. Quantitative primary outcome measures are much easier to be able to do statistical analysis on and uh, primary outcome measures which don't have a huge standard deviation are quite important. And so one of the things that we can do in terms of rigor is to ensure that studies are adequately powered. So ad adequate power is essential for rigor. And I hope that you all understand what statistical power in a study is. Um, uh, if not, I would uh, recommend you to look at the, the, the Bible of medical statistics. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's well, well understood. However, when you look in orthopedics, there are very few adequately powered studies. So this is a recent paper. This was published in 2015, and they looked at 465 randomized control trials. And what they saw was that they were split almost 50-50 between negative and positive findings. But 
the vast majority of these Sorry about that. Hopefully I'm back. Can you hear me all right? A thumbs up. Yeah. Good. Yes. Uh, yeah. The wonders of technology. Okay. Are my slides showing? They are indeed. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that won't happen again. My just computer just died. So apologies for that. Uh, so I think I was talking about this particular paper um, where they were looking at uh, over 400 randomized controlled trials, and a large number were uh, underpowered. There is a similar study which was published uh, actually uh, in 2020. And again, what this study has seen is that uh, none of the negative studies had sufficient power to detect a small effect size. So power is a real problem in orthopedic studies and particularly in randomized controlled trials of which there are few. So just in terms of the standard paper template, what we have is the title, the abstract, uh, the introduction, method, results, and discussion. And it's really quite straightforward to think about what we put in each one of those things, sections of introduction, method, results, and discussion. The introduction should be why you're undertaking the study that you're undertaking with a clear statement of either aim or hypothesis at the end. Methods, what you did. Results, what you found. And discussion, what does it all mean? So I really like this particular picture. So I review a lot of papers. I also have the misfortune of having to mark lots of undergraduate projects. And this is my very common experience. So you can have a paper that starts off well, you can have a really good introduction, and then it all goes downhill. And I think maybe you can all identify with this particular image. So just going to the title, um, a title is really very important because that's the thing that you find when you're searching on a particular topic. One of the issues that is um, a problem across all fields is that the titles very often tend to be method orientated. Um, but I think what is much more powerful is to have the main message in the title. You want to give people a reason for them to read your paper. And if the main message is there, that's going to draw them into reading your paper. I'll just give you an example um, by looking in PubMed. So I put in hip fractures. And you can see there's lots of papers which are just called hip fractures. It doesn't tell you anything else about the paper. It doesn't tell you any particular aspect of hip fractures. Uh, it is just orientated on hip fractures. I've taken some more examples, and these are examples from publications in my department in mechanical engineering. And you can see that these titles wouldn't draw you in to get you to read this particular paper because they're all about the methods as opposed to telling you something about the result. So uh, what we've attempted to do, what I've uh, get uh, people work with me to attempt to do is to actually give um, titles in which the main message is encapsulated so you can see here there are some examples where the main message comes through in the in the title of the paper. So what we're saying here in the first one is that integrating the combined sagittal index reduces the a risk of dislocation. Uh, you've got the fact that in the second one, machine learning outperforms clinical experts, and then in, in the third one that this particular surgery. Uh, device achieves a high level of accuracy. So the main finding is given there. So abstract, always write this last. And really what you need to be is very brief uh, in terms of summarizing the why, the aim, the main findings and the conclusion. If you have numerical results, you should give the main numerical result in this, in the abstract. It's the second thing that people will read. And often it's the point where they stop reading. 
So you want to be able to be very accurate, but also make sure you give your main findings. What it doesn't have space for is it doesn't have space for the limitations. And what you find is that if you write the abstract incorrectly, that might be the message that's taken away from your work, which is not the best thing. So introduction. And uh, in the paper by Brandt and Huskis, the recommendation is that this should be short, 500 words or less. And really, this is why, where you want to explain what is the reason for you undertaking the study. Provide enough context so people can understand it. Why is it important? And then finish either with a clear statement of aim or a clear statement of the hypothesis which is being investigated. Methods should be uh, between 500 to 1500 words. And this is what you did. And what you need to be able to do is give enough detail to allow repetition of the work. There is a problem in that journals now are limiting the length of papers. And it can be very difficult to be able to get enough detail in so that the work can be repeated. But it's really essential that work is repeated, uh, that things are um, duplicated elsewhere because it shows that it's not a one-off result. The other thing about the method, it's really important to include the analysis as part of the method. And in lots of studies, this analysis usually involves reducing the, the measured data in some form and then performing some statistics. And you should provide the details of the stats performed. There's a sort of uh, a trend towards really exotic statistics being used, um, which I'm not altogether comfortable with, because if you use very obscure statistical methods, um, it's difficult for people to be sure of what is done is correct, and it's also difficult to duplicate. And in the methods, you should also give the details of equipment, software, devices, and if you're talking about patients, about the cohort, should describe the cohort adequately, be as clear as possible, and wherever possible, use a schematic for the process of investigation that was done. And follow the best practice guidelines. So for um, studies that involve patients, ideally you should give a consort diagram where you can talk about the numbers that were lost for various reasons. So do look at the best practice guidelines, depending on which particular type of study you're looking at. One thing which is a particular bugbear of mine, I would urge you all to go on to BBC iPlayer and search for this particular episode of More or Less, which talks all about spreadsheet disasters, and in particular, disasters with Excel where Excel has been used as a research tool. Um, I would strongly recommend you not to use Excel. It is not a research tool. And uh, Microsoft defend the, the limitations of Excel, saying that it's not a research tool, it's an accounting tool. And there are lots and lots of examples where either lots of money has been lost or people have made really quite serious errors by doing things in Excel. What I would recommend is that you should use something uh, from one of this list. Uh, so R is very good. It's become much more accessible through R Studio. It's free. It's very robust. Lots of people use it. Uh, you could, if you feel inclined, uh, go down the hardcore Python route. Uh, but you can use statistical programs such as SPSS and Stata. And then if you're doing something a bit more mathematical, maybe you can use Mathematica or MATLAB. The advantages of something like R uh, and indeed Stata is that you analyze based on code. So you can have a record of what you did. If you're using something like Excel, what you're doing is you're manipulating cells uh, in rows and columns, and it's easy to make a mistake. 
So please do have a listen to that episode of More or Less. So results um, should be about 500 words. What you found is what you should be giving in the results. And give those results in the same order as the methods laid out what was being measured. And do not let extra methods creep into the results. A lot of people end up putting the statistical analysis as an add-on in the results. The statistical analysis is part of your methods. And the other thing that you should do with the results is describe your findings without trying to explain them. That's, for, that's what the discussion is for. I think it's really important to use plots for the main findings when you can, and then find the appropriate way to describe the information that's in those plots. And you know, there is a well-known saying that uh, a picture is worth so many words. And typically what is said is that a picture is worth a thousand words. So you have to think, how long does it take to write a thousand words? So you should spend a considerable amount of time preparing well thought out plots. And again, one of the reasons for steering people away from Excel, it's very easy to create a plot in Excel uh, that you haven't thought or spent a long time thinking about. So I advise you not to do it. Just an example of the power of statistical plots. This is from um, uh, Visual Capitalist. And it's a really nice plot, which explains uh, life expectancy at birth as a function of healthcare expenditure. And you have all these countries listed. And it's a really clear diagram. Uh, it's got some annotation. It's very easy to understand. And there's a lot of information encapsulated in this uh, plot. Here's an example from uh, one of our studies where we looked at the strength of a transosseous uh, medial meniscus root repair and looking at two different types of material and then putting the repair in different positions. And one thing I would say is if you've got relatively small number of repeats, as we had here, it was better just to plot the data. Um, not to plot averages. Uh, so if you've got relatively small amounts of data, plot the data so that your reader can see the data and be very clear about the labeling of the axes and just make it as... The other thing with figures is that they really help you to explain your concepts. Again, this is an example of... Um, a couple of figures I'm going to show you from a paper from this particular paper we wrote um, on immune toxicity of cobalt chrome. And there were some complex issues that we wanted to talk about, about the lubrication and the uh, lack of lubrication that can occur according to the implantation orientation of the device. And what you, you can do with well thought out is to explain rather complicated uh, concepts in an easy to understand way. And then we followed that on with a, a, a diagram which tried to explain the mechanism that we thought was occurring, giving rise to adverse uh, reactions to metal debris. So moving on to this is the, where I find that a lot of people end up writing either pages and pages and pages or hardly anything at all. Um, and as with results, sometimes there is a misunderstanding or an ability, inability to understand what should go in the discussion section. Uh, possibly it's the most important section. Um, you, are, you should aim to revisit, revisit the aim and hypothesis. You should explore the assumptions and limitations. And this is your opportunity to explain why some of the findings are not what you expected or what has been shown elsewhere with previous work. And then you should try in some way to synthesize those results and make a conclusion which is based on your own findings. Um, I, I read a lot of discussion papers, uh, there are a lot of papers in which the discussion section, um, they've made a conclusion which is completely 
odds with the results that they presented. So the authors have a, an idea of what they wanted to say, and regardless of what their own results told them, they went ahead and said it in the discussion. I think it's very important to always make sure your conclusions are based on your findings. Uh, references are a particular issue when it comes to writing papers. It is very important to make sure you have up-to-date references and to make sure you have read the references and not just the abstract. Uh, I've come across numerous examples where you can see that the authors have said, oh, we need a reference to back this up, done a such quick search, and then picked a reference uh, by just skimming through the abstract. And the, if you read the paper, oftentimes there's something in the paper which may lead the, someone to have an opposite conclusion. And I would urge you all to use a reference manager. There's lots available. Uh, it will save you a huge amount of time. And process of writing a paper, it is good to make sure you review the literature regularly. It might take you a while to write your paper and things can change. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're not out of date. So in terms of process, I think it's really important to plan and really think about that main message. And you're going to understand the main message when you have a clear articulation of the aim and you understand what your results are telling you. So I would suggest that you really just bullet point your sections, make sure you prepare your results section very well. You can think about what that main message should be. You can go back and fill in the introduction and methods, and then really sit back and think about the discussion. I would uh, advise you to just spend a lot of time considering your data plots and use annotation where you can to make it clearer to the reader. Write the draft, make sure you use a spell checker. It sounds very basic, but it's amazing how often this is done. And then I would put it aside. You need to sort of then wipe your mind of that paper and then reread it yourself as if it was written by someone else. Because what you're going to do is you're going to send your paper for publication to somebody who hopefully has had nothing to do with it. And you have had a great deal to do with that paper. And it might be your research that you've been living uh, with for the last few years and then you're writing it up. When you write, read it back to yourself immediately after writing it, you will look like a piece of genius because you'll understand everything. But your brain is filling in all the missing bits. And when you give it to somebody else who hasn't been involved, they may not understand what it is that you've been trying to convey. So what's a useful skill to do is to have the ability to reread it as if it was written by somebody else. And it will be a very useful way of understanding whether you have met the requirements of communicating. And I just put this picture up here again. Uh, and it's about trying to make sure that the discussion, which is the most important part, is not the bit that you rush. Uh, the discussion is where you are really using your results to address the question that was set. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will stop sharing. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. And um, we're going to move on to the next presentation now. Um, Mohammed, are you okay to share your screen, please? Yeah, hello. It's going to be hard to follow that one. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Mohammed. I'm a SD4 registrar on the Warwick Orthopedic Training Program. Um, but I'm currently taking time out to do a PhD at the University of Warwick, and that's being funded by NIHR. 
So this session of the series was going to focus on how to write a research paper, research questions and outcome measures. I've decided to approach the subject in a slightly different order, only because I think it makes a bit more sense to write the research paper at the end after you've decided what the research question and the outcome measures are going to be. So we just to kick off. Oh, wait, we can't um, see your slides at the moment. Oh. How do I do that? So um, if you go on to the share screen button. Oh, yeah. At the bottom. Is it working now? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. And so if you put it in presenter mode. OK, thanks. Perfect. OK, cool. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Mohammed. Um, so yeah, I was gonna to talk to you about how to write a research paper, research questions and outcome measures. I'm gonna do this the other way around. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about research questions, outcome measures, and then how to write a research paper, because that's usually the bit you do at the end. Okay, so to kick off, um, we need to understand what a research question is. And essentially it's the question that your project is trying to answer. And it frames what your study is about. It's basically the sole purpose of the whole work you're setting out to do. And until you nail down your research question, then you can't progress with your study. So after you've done that part, then you need to phrase your research question, but you need to resist the temptation to make it too long and too specific. But at the same time, you don't want it to be too general either. So it should be specific enough and include the salient points only. A good rule of thumb is to use the PICO format. Um, it's pretty famous, so it's got four parts. It talks about the population uh, that's being studied, the intervention and the comparison. If you're talking about a um, comparative cohort study or some kind of interventional study like a randomized controlled trial, and then what outcomes you are going to be investigating. Um, obviously, it doesn't work for all formats. So if you're doing a epidemiological study, looking at the prevalence and the incidence, then you might have to tweak it slightly because you're not going to have an intervention and a comparison. Cool. So um, I thought I'd include a, a few research question examples. Um, so I'm just going to start a poll. Um, well, Hannah, if you could, please, because I'm not very familiar with Zoom. Thank you. Yeah. So if everybody could just have a read of the research question on the slide and then answer the question and give your opinion on how good this kind of research question is. So it looks like half of the participants are going for adequate. And then a quarter are saying it's very good. Some are saying it's a bit poor and another minority are saying it's excellent. Okay. So I, I think it's pretty poor. Um, it, it doesn't include all the um, four components of PICO. So, you, you know, here they're talking about antibiotic fluid bone cement and patients undergoing total hip replacement. So yes, it's got the population. It's got perhaps the intervention but it doesn't really describe the comparative group or what outcomes these studies looking at so a better way to phrase it would have been something like this so what is the effect of antibiotic fluid bone cement that's the intervention you've got your comparison group which is plain bone cement your outcome is the rate of revision for all causes and then you've got your population which is um you know patients undergoing elective primary hip replacement So that kind of incorporates all four parts of PICO. It makes sense. It's not too long. It includes all the salient parts. And I think that's a good research question. So here's another example. Um, I was, shall we do another poll for this one? See what people think about this research question. Do dual mobility components and total hip arthroplasty improve outcomes? Good, okay, fine. So the majority there, 80% are going for poor. Yeah, I was, I was gonna go for poor as well. Um, and again, that could be phrased to something like, does the use of dual mobility components, which is the intervention in primary total hip arthroplasty, that's your population, 
reduce the rate of all cause of vision, the vision for dislocation, which are your outcomes, compared with conventional bearings, which is your comparative group. Okay. So then what makes a good research question? Um, so the subject of your research question is also important. Um, most research questions develop from observations in clinical practice where you typically identify a problem or an issue and you base a question around that. Um, it needs to be something new that's not been done before, so you're contributing to the literature, or you might be building on existing work, or perhaps repeating a study but addressing its substantial limitations. Um, the question also needs to be clinically relevant, but also important to other um, stakeholders, such as patients. Um, if patients, you know, for example, don't care whether they're getting a blood transfusion after the surgery, then that kind of diminishes the significance of the work. Um, your question needs to be answerable as well. So it doesn't matter if you have the best question in the world, but you can't answer it. Ideally, the answers need to be based on data and facts rather than opinion. Um, there could be many reasons why you can't answer the question, whether that's because you can't get the data needed or it doesn't fit your time frame, or because it's too technical. And then lastly, it has to be interesting to you, otherwise you just won't finish the project and be able to answer that research question which you set out at the beginning. So talk a bit about outcome measures now. So firstly, what is an outcome measure? Um, well, it, it's a standardized instrument that captures data on a specific outcome. For example, there's an example of the visual analog scale at the bottom right of the slide, and that's usually completed by patients to score their pain. Um, and it's really important to stress that your whole study and your research project boils down to two things. It's your research question and it's your outcome or your outcome measure. If you can't capture the necessary information that you need to answer your research question, then your results aren't really gonna be solid. So for example, if my research question was whether patients with total hip replacements can complete marathons, then the outcomes of interest would be, did they complete the marathon? Yes or no, which is the outcome measure. How long did it take them to complete it? That's another outcome. And the outcome measure would be time, uh, you know, time in hours and minutes. If I was to use an outcome measure, say maximum heart rate, um, you know, it wouldn't confidently tell me that they've just completed the marathon because their heart rate was high for a very long time. So it's really important you select the appropriate outcome measure that, you know, that gives you, that gives you the information and the data that you'll need to answer your research question. The outcome measure you choose also has to be valid. Now, what I mean by that is that it has to do what it's meant to do and capture the truth. So, for example, in my opinion, the recent introduction of an infamous exam um, for core surgical training applicants hasn't actually been proved to be able to differentiate between the quality of the applicants. Therefore, it can't be considered a valid outcome measure to be used in that scenario. But it's probably a reliable outcome measure because if I repeated the exam, I'd probably end up having the same test results um, as the previous sitting if I didn't do any extra studying. But in contrast, say your driving license test that you have to sit, that's probably a valid exam because those who pass the test are probably better drivers and have had the fewer crashes than those who don't. And it's probably also reliable because if you resit the test, you'll probably get the same, you'll get the same outcome or the same result that you had the previous time. Um, last thing I want to mention about outcome measures on this slide is that make sure you pick an outcome measure that's that's easy to measure. Um, especially if you're not the one that's gonna be doing it. So for example, if your outcome measure was an angle because you're measuring deformity correction, that's gonna be far more challenging to measure than whether the patient had a reoperation or not, for example. Okay. So a bit more about outcome measures on this slide. So outcome measures, you've got so many different types of outcome measures, you know, um, it can be disease specific, so it's only valid and reliable in a certain subpopulation. For example, I've put on the slide there the Oxford Knee Score, abbreviated as the OKS, and that's for patients who've recently received knee replacement surgery. Um, or you can have the EQ5D, which measures you know, quality of life. You can have outcome measures which are performance based, uh, which typically involve an independent assessor. 
um, or you can have patient report, reported outcomes, which are particularly useful at capturing information and data through the lens of the patient, for example, function and satisfaction, um, which patients can answer through a questionnaire. Um, some of you may have heard about composite outcome measures, and these consist of multiple distinct components, such as the EQ5. an overall score of the quality of five different dimensions, which includes mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, anxiety, and depression. Now, there's many advantages to using composite outcomes. Um, for example, if I was to say another example of an a composite outcome, it doesn't really help you understand the causes for the revision surgery, um, because it's just giving you the revision for any particular indication. But the advantage here is that you're increasing your sample size and the number of events you're capturing because you're oh, I was unmuted there. Um, now, I was saying composite outcomes, all cause revision rate is, is, a, is an example of a composite outcome. And the advantage is that it's capturing date, lots of data, revision for all causes, any, any particular indication of revision. Um, that will increase your sample size and the number of events that you'll expect to see and that you'll get in your study, and therefore it'll increase your statistical power. Um, and it also means that the length of your study and the time that it takes, um, in the time that it takes, it'll be quicker. So, and, and obviously the costs associated with that will be far less. So it's a more efficient um, study in terms of time and um, cost. But the disadvantage is that some studies don't report on the reasons for the revisions, uh, even if they would be underpowered to be meaningful. Um, so you've got to just bear those things in mind. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about bias as well, um, because you can have the best outcome measure there is possible. Um, you know, you can have the best study possible, but if your outcome measure and the collection of the data is being biased, um, then that's going to affect the information that you're getting, the information that you're gathering. Um, and that could be particularly problematic in surgery, um, where you can't blind the surgeon, for example. Um, and that's another advantage of a um, patient reported outcome, because patients can be easily blinded, generally speaking, when they're asleep because they're having a general anesthetic for the procedure. Okay. So there's many factors to balance and consider, um, and that's why study design can be very difficult. Um, so quickly um, move on and talk about how to write a research paper. Um, so quickly, we'll do a quick poll again. Hannah, can you start the next poll, please? Okay, so about half of the audience is saying that they've not published a paper before. 10% have published it as a first author, uh, about 5 to 10% have published as a co-author, and about a quarter of the audience is, is working on a paper as we speak, which is great. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about how to write a research paper. Um, but firstly, what is a research paper? Well, it, it's a report that you've generated for the research question you set out at the beginning. And there's different types of research papers. You've got systematic reviews, you've got meta-analyses, you've got cohort studies, you've got case series, you've got randomized control trials, but they all follow much or less the same general format. Okay. Having said that, the journal you're planning to submit might not actually accept the type of article you've prepared. So for example, if you're writing a new surgical technique and you're looking to get that published, then relatively few journals are going to allow you to submit such an article to their journal. Um, and each journal has got specific formatting requirements. So there's going to be limits on the word count. There's going to be limits on how many tables you can have, how many figures you can have, and also how many references. And I think it's really important to stress that you have to 
check this out at the beginning uh, and make sure you don't get caught out at the end after you've written your entire manuscript and you realize that you're only allowed 15 references and then you have to go back and you know re-edit the entire manuscript and that's a lot of time and extra energy make sure that you try and publish in a journal which is PubMed citable i've put a link there on the slide for the list of journals um, which are PubMed citable um, i have that saved as a as a bookmark and you know i i regularly um, use it as a reference before i submit a manuscript to a journal or you know i i think about submitting a manuscript to that journal um, have a look at the impact factor for the journal. Um, so this is basically a, a score that's given to the journal um, and it's uh, how often the articles that get published in that journal are cited, basically. Um, and it's really important try and get something published in a high impact factor journal. Um, it's basically, it'll get far more attention. Uh, um, it's almost like a, a Twitter user, or a Facebook user with lots of followers. Um, so you, you're far more likely to, to get um, the audience reading your paper and your work, which is what you want. APC, that stands for Article Processing Charge. So some journals actually charge you a processing fee. Sometimes this is upfront when you submit the, um, when you submit your manuscript. Um, bear in mind that it doesn't necessarily mean your manuscript is going to be accepted. And then other times it's the, the fee is due if your manuscript gets accepted and it's going to be published. And then consider the turnaround time. So after you submit your manuscript, it probably takes about two months until you get um, you know, the outcome and the feedback from the reviewers. Um, if the you know, feedback is that they're willing to accept the manuscript, uh, if you make certain uh, revisions, then after you make the revisions, you send it back to them. It can take another couple of months before you get the final outcome. And then it can take several more months um, before the article gets published. So just um, be conscious of the timeline, particularly you know, if you're applying for job applications in the future and you're trying to get publications on your CV, um, make sure you do this well ahead, and well ahead of time. And then I've put a link there to something called the Equator Network. Um, which is a website that basically contains guidelines on how you should um, format your paper and what's required for presenting the results of a specific paper. So there's different um, um, you know, guidelines for systematic reviews. For example, there's PRISMA, um, for RCTs is another one, and for cohort studies is something else. So just make sure you adhere to that um, because it's good practice. Um, I thought I'd touch a bit about academic hedging as well, because it's very useful in manuscript writing. Um, basically, what it means is that you can't be certain in life. Um, and that's kind of what Benjamin Franklin said back in the 1700s. Um, and then Albert Einstein said something similar 100 years after him, but he got rid of the part about taxes and death, um, which is slightly ironic. But anyway, I digress. Um, what both of them are trying to say is basically don't use stuff such as, you know, words such as always, or never in your manuscript, because there's always going to be exceptions. Um, rather use words like, like these. So um, could, may, um, something suggests or appears that or it might. So just get used to that kind of language in your manuscript. OK, so moving on to the title. Um, so the title of your manuscript, you can kind of phrase this in three different ways. You can pose it as a question. So, for example, this is a paper that I'd vote. Um, um, this is a paper that I'd written. Um, this is three different ways that you could phrase this manuscript. So, the title could be Does adding antibiotics to cement reduce the need for early revision in total neuroplasticity? Um, you could make it a bit more general, which is what the, um, what the reviewers wanted, um, which we had to change to, uh, and they changed it to this. Um, but my personal preference when I submitted it was actually um, this title, um, and it gives the finding of this study. Uh, and it, there's pros and cons of each, and personally I prefer this option. I think it gets to the point, it's direct, and it gives you the answer straight away in the title. There's no hidden messages and it's not ambiguous. In terms of the abstract, I think this is probably the hardest 
um, part of the paper to write. Um, and also you have to put a lot of time and effort into this. It's probably what most people are gonna read before deciding to commit to reading the rest of your paper. Um, and it's difficult to write because it's 250 words. It's really condensed. Um, and when I draft an abstract, I usually write, I, actually, I, I usually do it at the end. So I write out my entire manuscript um, and then, you know, because after you write your entire manuscript, all the information's in your head, you've summarized everything, you know, you've, you've written everything um, on the manuscript. And then what you have to do is um, you go back and you write your abstract, which is a summary. And a summary is always far easier to do at the end of the manuscript than if you try and do a summary at the start of the manuscript. So that's kind of my logic behind that. Uh, and then similarly to what Professor Gill was saying, um, Go come back to it, you know, and that goes for any your entire manuscript. Come back to it, you know, read it with um, you know a, a fresh mind. Try and forget about it, put it away. Come back to it, read it later. Uh, remove any sentences which aren't essential. And what you can do is you just remove the line, and then you ask yourself, does this paragraph or does the meaning change at all if I remove this line? And if it doesn't, that means it's probably not necessary, and you can take it out. Um, so your introduction, um, this is probably one of the, the easier parts of the manuscript to write, I think. Um, start off talking about the context of the problem or the issue. So for example, total knee replacements are being performed using computer navigation and, and are believed to improve component positioning. That's the issue that you're talk talking about. Then talk about why it's important. improve longevity of the prosthesis. Then talk about any ways of confirming the effects of using these devices in all cause of vision rate. And then at the end, you just put in your aim. So this study aims to, okay. And it's usually kind of the shortest part of the manuscript tends to be around 500 words as Professor Gill was saying. Um, the methods, I think, I'll, I'll for the method section, I'll, I can't stress enough how detailed you have to be. Um, the reader is basically looking to see whether the way you've approached the research is satisfactory. And the method section has to be detailed and include enough information that it allows anyone who reads that section to be able to repeat your experiment. And they should be able to reproduce the same results. Make it logical. Just write out what you did and in what order. Doesn't have to include every detail but you'll get a good idea of the level of detail by reading lots of research papers. The results, um, probably not so much to say about this section, it's probably the easier part to write, I think. Um, follow the guidelines on the equator network um, and how they want you to present the results of that specific paper. Um, present the data, but structure it. So for example, it can be structured by outcome, you know, revision for infection, revision for loosening, revision for dislocation, or you can structure it by population, you know, under over 65 or over 60 years of age. Okay. And in your results section, there's no interpretation here. So don't try and interpret the data, just present, you know, just present the facts, just present your information there. Okay. The interpretation of the data is kind of what you do in the discussion section. And this is kind of how I structure my discussions discussion section, usually I have four paragraphs. Um, the first paragraph is just a short summary of the findings, you know, of, of your paper. And the second paragraph, you know, you can talk about other papers and what they found in the literature and how it compares to your results and your findings. Third paragraph, you can talk about the strengths and the limitations of your papers, what you did to try and limit them, um, and also how generalizable are your results. And then, you know, the fourth paragraph can be your conclusion, which is the, the so what element. A common mistake is people start repeating the results again in their discussion. That's not what the discussion section is for. You've stated your results um, in your results section. You can refer to your results in your discussion, but it shouldn't include any numbers at all. Okay. And then lastly, I'll mention references. So about 10 years ago, I wrote my first paper and nobody told me what a reference manager is. Um, I used to manually type out the reference and then I'd have to go back and edit the order of my bibliography every time my supervisor sent me back the manuscript with revisions um, and my heart sunk every time. Um, use a reference manager, it is a game changer once you become familiar with it. 
Um, you can probably get it free from, un from the university website. Um, I recommend EndNote, that's kind of what I use. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you, go if you YouTube it or Google it, you'll understand how it can make your life so much easier. Um, so I'll almost, this is my second last slide. I'll finish off basically by saying that academic writing is a skill and you'll develop it over time. Um, like anything, the more you do it, the better you get at it and the easier it becomes. Um, I put my Twitter handle on the slide in case anyone wants to ask me any questions after the session. Um, and also a bit of a shameless plug, but if anyone's interested in getting involved in a national collaborative research study, then HAST is about to start in May and it's looking at the national variation in the management of hip fracture patients taking anticoagulant medications. Um, if anyone's interested, um, there's the QR code and there's the Twitter handle uh, and the email address. Um, and there's instructions on how to get registered on those pages. Uh, there's not many spaces left. Okay, thank you for listening. Thanks for uh, presenting. Uh, we're now going to move on to the QA session. Um, yeah, so just in terms of questions, we have a couple of questions here. Um, so the first one from Victoria. Um, her question is regarding the quality of writing research papers and how to navigate this as a foundation doctor interested in surgery, but she finds research is almost seen as a means to get into a training program or a tick box process. Yeah, there is that aspect of wanting to do a paper, not really caring what it is, and then just trying to get a, a set of publications for your CV. And, you know, you, you have to have a vested interest in the question or your vested interest in the research in, the, in able to put in a lot of effort. Research papers take, good research papers take a long time and you've got to invest a fair bit of effort into them. And so you need to do something that you're interested in. And I, I see the point about trying to get uh, papers for your CV. But if you're trying to improve outcomes for patients, you need to do high quality work and you need to be prepared to invest a lot of time in it. Um, there was a, a publication quite a few years ago. It was just a very general publication talking about the cost of a paper. And you know, you're, it, it is about uh, easily a hundred thousand pounds worth of time and effort and maybe many multiples of that that go to generating a, a large a, a high quality paper and so you know if you're going to do something of high quality you need to have quite a lot of commitment to it i don't know if you've got anything to add mohammed um yeah i'd agree with all that i think unfortunately is a necessary part for, me for medical um medical school and you know for future job applications it is unfortunately just it is something that you have to do and it does get your points um i i don't think there is a way around it um, you don't necessarily have to do it um but if you know if, if you're going into a competitive specialty such as orthopedics um then you've got to look you know your cv needs to be pretty attractive to to, to the people who are examining your CV. Um, and, and, and you need the points for that application, you know, to because you're competing against other people. So it's something I think which is not essential that you do, but if you're looking to um, strengthen your application and give yourself the edge over other applicants, then you, you need publications on your CV. I think you'll gain a lot from the experience, even though you might not enjoy it, uh, and you'll have a more critical mindset after completing your project, and you'll gain lots of skills and lots of knowledge along the way. Uh, and you know, you never know at the end of the project, you might actually find that you enjoy research and you want to continue doing other projects afterwards. I was just going to add one thing. I was saying that it's much easier if you're supported by people who've got experience. Um, so if you're looking to do, you know, build your CV, it's worthwhile going to a unit with a strong academic component where the 
um, where your, your supervisors have got experience in writing and have a commitment to doing high quality work. That, you know, that, that's always been the, the sort of divi the dividing factor between academic and non-academic units. Perfect, thank you guys. Um, the next question is, could you describe again what academic hedging is? I think, um, Mr. Farhan, that was for you. Yeah, essentially I was saying, you can't be certain about anything. Um, so don't, don't say always or never. You know, when you sometimes do multiple choice questions and you see an option that says, you know, something is always, um, you know, always the case. That's that's usually false, isn't it? That's that's the wrong answer in the multiple choice question. And it goes this, it goes the same thing goes. You know, when you're writing a paper or a manuscript, um, don't be. Uh, you can't say you're certain about something. Okay, you can't say always or never. You shouldn't be using those, you know, those words in your manuscript. Start. You know, you can you can use words like maybe or most likely or you know, something along those lines, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then the other thing about it, you, you can always qualify things as far as we are aware. Uh, and it, it's good to sort of say the findings suggest that, um, you know, uh, sometimes you can be definitive, but if you're going to be definitive, make sure you put your con uh, uh, constraints in there. You know, you say in this particular circumstance, or within this population, the results were definitive. You know, you want to make sure you set those limitations so that it's not taken to be a generalized quote. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, um, I don't know who this is directed at specifically, but I think that they wanted a bit more clarity regarding how to make a study fast versus slow. Um, or yeah Mr. so again this is in general if you're going to do something of high quality and you're going to do it prospectively it's going to take a while um if you join a program of ongoing work you know programs of ongoing work will generate data and there will be sub questions hanging off the main question so if you want to be able to get to uh, the point where you can write something relatively quickly, then it's worthwhile joining a, a unit that's got a large program of online work that you can become part of. And uh, you know, in terms of collecting data, that takes a while. But if there is a data set that's already been collected as part of a study, and it's permissible to uh, take a sub question, you know, that's that's a faster way of doing. It, but it, it in general, if, if you want to do something of high quality, you want to be involved in every aspect of that. So if you're prospectively collecting data, that will take time. Yeah, I agree. I think you, you can't compromise on, on the research work and the data that you're going to generate. If, you know, if the research project, you know, you need to give the research project time. If you if you take it too fast and you compromise on the results, then you need to be wary that once this goes out and it gets published, people are going to read it and people are going to, you know, people are going to, are going to apply the, that data to their future research with the clinical practice. And obviously that has important implications. Perfect. Thank you. Um, then, so the next last question is, do the so I think the content of this lecture does it apply to systematic reviews and literature literature reviews, and can you advise on how to find the right journal to publish a paper? Yeah, so in a in a systematic review, you're still going to do those same things. You're going to set out your aim. Um, the the thing with a systematic review is that there are lots of guidelines about how to do a systematic review. Uh, uh, to a certain extent, a systematic review is a way of trying to generate a publication without having to generate any data yourself. Uh, it's changing a little bit because there is now a statistical requirement for the data that you are presenting because you will be doing some analysis, usually in some of these formalized statistical methods. But you want to be able to sh uh, show that you have 
exhausted your search um, sources so you haven't missed anything and then have a reason for pruning back um, but you're still going through those same processes and what you want to be able to do is to take the information that you have reviewed and you should aim to add something. You should aim to be able to um, to be able to add something of value through the process of doing the review. If the review doesn't add any value, then there's no point in doing it. And then finding the right journal. Uh, you need to be sure about who is going to be your target audience for the paper. That already sets the scope. And um, within each uh, specialty, there are a range of journals available. Impact factors are maybe a guide, but it is, um, you know, it's not always quite clear why certain journals have higher impact factors. But what there are an indication of is how widely they are read. If they are read widely and then they're cited, that will give rise to the impact factor. Um, I would always recommend that you should try to go to a paper, a publication, a journal listed on PubMed. Um, PubMed listed papers have a quality threshold that has to be met. And then in some respects, really good high quality work, if you've got some very good high quality work, then go to a general journal. Uh, so you have general journals which have very, very high impact factors. And the, the work has to be of interest outside of your speciality, but um, it can generate more wider readership for your papers. For example, uh, publishing particular methods in the uh, publishing work in the sort of nature family of journals uh, gives you much more exposure than it would doing it in an orthopedic, but it might not be the audience that you want to reach. Uh, so it really does depend on who you're trying to reach with your publication and the, the, the level of quality that you have in your work. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farhan, do you have anything to add to that or? No. Um, the next question is, I think, uh, how how do you find the Haste Collaborative? I think um, Shiv put a link in there as and you did as well. Um, so anyone who wants to join the collaboration, the links are on the meeting chat. Um, next question is, how should we approach research supervisors in highly academic universities if I'm not coming from an academic university? And uh, so... If we're, if we're talking about trainees, I think if you're looking for training positions in um, clinical units who are attached to universities, that's always a good start. Uh, so, uh, Mohammed, you're in um, Coventry. It's attached to the uh, Coventry University Hospitals. You've got a good group of people who've got uh, a track record. Um, and you know, networking with um, networking in uh, research meetings is always a good idea. Um, people are generally approachable, and there is often a willingness to have another pair of hands to help. Uh, and whether these things are paid or unpaid, it's it's difficult to say because it's it become increasingly difficult to have uh, paid positions sometimes. But if you've got interest, I think there are opportunities. Perfect. Um, so th that's the end of the questions. Um, just touching on the last point, there are lectures in the next couple of weeks that touch on study design. So in terms of literature review and systematic review, those all will be covered in the next um, few series. Um, in terms of certificates, yes, yeah, so once you fill out the feedback forms, they, the certificates will be sent round. Um, and the seed fund that I mentioned last time. So that will be available for people who attend 50% of lectures. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to add from my end. Shiv, do you have anything to add? No, just uh, thank you very much for attending and thank you to Prof Gil and uh, Mohammed for, for their fantastic talks. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Okay.
Thank you, everybody. And Thanks. apologies for my you. technical problems. <laughs>